welcome everyone uh, to our Seeding for Success in 2012 webinar. Uh, we've got three presenters this morning. As mentioned, uh, I'm Derwin Hammond. I, I host uh, each of our uh, crop production webinars. Uh, we really wanted to focus on uh, seeding uh, with projections of record acreage going in the ground and, and seeding in a lot of areas getting started maybe a little bit earlier than normal. Uh, we've got some recent research from our science cluster work showing that it's really important uh, to get a good uniform stand and adequate plant population and a uniform plant population established in the field and that that can go a long way to uh, achieving a successful canola crop. So our three presenters this morning, Sean Senko, he's our, our Canola Council Agronomy Specialist in Eastern Saskatchewan. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit for, for any of you that have some uh, last minute uh, drill box decisions with record acreage, often some of those last fields are a last minute decision. Uh, you may not have access to the same variety um, that you were planning on a lot of your other acres and so uh, you may be looking at some, some different varieties that you're not as familiar with. Uh, so Sean's going to cover our canola, production, uh, canola performance trial uh, results and the new online tool that's available to to look through that data and analyze it and, uh, and compare the varieties based on a number of different attributes. So he's just going to give you a bit of a rundown on how to utilize that tool to help you find the information you're looking for, uh, some of that, that third party information that we provide. And then Dan Orchard is going to take over. He's going to touch on uh, fertility, uh, particularly as you head out to the field, some key things to think for. Uh, to, or to think about um, in terms of things like safe seed place rates. Uh, with the gain, the record acreage projected, uh, there's already a bit of talk that in some locations, the logistics of getting adequate quantities of fertilizer in place uh, in time for what looks like it may be an earlier seeding window uh, is potentially an issue. So he's also going to touch on what are some of some options? So what do you need to get in place at seeding time and, and maybe what are some options to top dress later on if you can't access all the products you're looking for at seeding? And then finally, Doug Moisey is going to take over and he's really going to talk about uh, how to determine what's an appropriate seeding rate for the seed lot you're working with and what are some other tips to maximize that germination and emergence and the uniformity of that plant population. Uh, so with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll start by turning things over to Sean and uh, he's going to run you through the, the canola performance trial uh, data in the online tool. Hello everybody, um, Sean Sanko. I'm going to uh, give you a rundown of our canola performance trials here for 2011. Uh, the canola performance, performance trials were um, launched to replace the, the PCVD program which uh, ended in 2009. So uh, here we've got the, the home page of the, the canola performance trials.ca website. I'm just going to run you through all the links on the, on the home page here and give you an idea of what what, uh, what's involved in the website. So to begin with here, we'll, we'll kind of go through the search features that allow you to look at the, uh, the different varieties. There's two main search features. Uh, the map view, along with a filter for the map, and the uh, compare varieties tool. So we'll get started here by taking a, a look at the map first. So I'm going to simply click on the, the map icon. And uh, up pops a map of uh, all the sites in Western Canada. What we've got here are three different colored pins. Uh, green pin represents small plots. The brown pin, uh, field scale sites. Uh, gray pin represents multiple sites under the pin that are both small and field scale sites. So for example, here near Regina, there's a, a gray pin with the number 18 on it. What that says is under that pin there's 18 sites 
um, with a mix of both small and field scale sites. It's just a, a way to unclutter the map. So I'll click on that pin with 18 sites. It zooms me in closer. Uh, there still are a few pins with sites uh, close together, so I'll go on this uh, three pin here again. Click on it, zoom me in closer. I've now been brought up to um, three sites around Indian Head, Saskatchewan. So the uh, again, the green, the small plot site. I'll click on the on the site. Up will pop the uh, all the information for that particular site. Uh, all the varieties grown in that site will be represented here, along with the information for each variety. So um, location, this is the Indian Head site, uh, year 2011, it's a mid-zone, and it's right now it's ranked by yield, uh, also days to maturity, uh, lodging if available, height, and the gross revenue, which is simply the yield multiplied by a fixed price plus any premium for uh, specialty oils. So right now, uh, the varieties are ranked by yield. Uh, it's in um, descending order. As soon as we click on yield, it'll switch it around to ascending order. Uh, if it's getting late in the season and your interest is more towards uh, days to maturity, you simply click on the days to maturity, and it'll rank the varieties um, beginning in the shortest to longest maturity, or again, uh, longest maturity down. Um, if you want to know more about the, the particular site, how the site was managed, you simply click on the, um, the name here, any one of these Indian Head 3, Saskatchewan, click on the link, up will pop a new window. Within this window, all the herbicides applied to, to each of the different systems are listed, uh, the fungicides if used, uh, fertility for that site, rainfall from um, April right through to, to August for the site, as well as other comments. Um, here we've got the particular premiums used, calculating each one of the, the specialty varieties, and um, any relevant um, site information. So at this particular site, there were some plants stressed by excessive moisture, as well as some diamond uh, back moth larvae present. Okay, so we'll, we'll close this overlay here takes us back to the map. Let's take a quick look at one of the um, field scale sites here as well, near Indian Head. So here we have um, this particular field scale site. There are three varieties represented. Again, same as the other information. Uh, you have yield, days to maturity, lodging, height, and gross revenue. As well, when you're in this pane, you can also view all the results as a graph. That's your preference. Um, and so there's, uh, all the yield is listed in a bar graph format now. So if we're mousing over each one of the bars, it'll give you the exact yields. Again, if you want to uh, see days to maturity, simply click on the change filters button, and now all the varieties are ranked by days to maturity. So that is primarily the map function. We'll head back to the, the main page, which is either clicking on the canola performance trials um, logo here, or any one of these buttons, you can navigate around the site. So I'm going to click on the logo, it'll take me back to the home page. So the next function we'll look at is the performance trials filter. What this is, it's a filter for the map. It just uh, unclutters the map a bit. So if I know I only want to see field scale results, and I know I'm only going to be using the first two chemistries here, I'll highlight both these chemistries once they're lit up. I'll generate results. It'll take me back to the map. As you can see now, there are no green pins or gray pins. So all sites on the map now are only field scale sites with the first two chemistries, um, herbicide groups chosen. So just a way of um, making it easier to select what you're looking for. As well, we've got this uh, little map on the side here. Uh, by clicking on it, it enlarges. It's just a way of um, showing you what, what season zone you're in. So all the small plot sites for 2011 are listed on this map, along with the long, mid, and short season zones. Okay, we will close this up now. Head back to the main page again by clicking on the logo. Um, the next 
tool to compare varieties is your second way of comparing varieties. So when you click on it, up comes this table with a list of all the varieties grown in uh, 2011 in the program. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose the three market checks for each of the herbicide system. Uh, the market checks are the varieties paid for by the grower groups. So I'm going to add, first of all, the, the Liberty Link market check and the Clearfield market check by simply clicking on this Add Variety Comparison. When you click on that, it, um, the varieties are placed in this box down here, Variety Comparison, so you know which one you which varieties you've selected. We go to the next page and find the Roundup Ready Market Check here and add it to the comparison as well. Now I have my three varieties chosen. <clears throat> I'm going to continue. Up pops this um, particular menu. For the first time, I'm going to leave everything blank and just generate results. What that will do is uh, generate results for all of Western Canada. So there were 23 small plot sites uh, in 2011 in the program. And um, these are the results over all 23 small plot sites. So again, right now, um, the graph is listed in bushels per acre. And simply mousing over each one of the bars will give you the, the actual number. You can change that, days to maturity, and so on and so forth with each one of the four. Different, uh, filters. What I'm going to do is close this, take it back to this particular variety selection tool again. I'll keep the same three varieties selected, continue, but now instead of all of Western Canada, I want to know around Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, because that's where um, my particular farm is located. Um, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and within 200 kilometer radius. So I'm going to know all the, the site data for 200 kilometers around Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Generate results. <clears throat> so what comes up now, you'll see on the bottom, within 200 kilometers of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, there are five sites used to generate these results. Again, all your um, information is listed by yield. You can change the filters. Uh, here you can, on back at this uh, selection page here, you can choose um, as little as two varieties, or if you'd like, you can choose every variety um, in the program, all 25 entries. So uh, we'll, we'll head back to the home page again. And we'll click on this link right here, the performance trial summary. What this is, it's a link to the PDF of the, the booklet created for the Canola Performance Trials for 2011. So this allows you to see the, um, the data in a PDF format. Uh, it's printable as well and gives you a little more background on the Canola Performance Trials program. So here we've got uh, summary tables for the small plots, summary graphs for the small plots. Uh, these are summaries for the, each season zone. <clears throat> uh, here, summaries by season zone as well as um, small plot for every location uh, summaries and uh, large plot data. So if you if you choose to, you want a printed copy, this is the best way to, to have a printed copy carried on with the, the site data. Okay, um, close that window back to the home page. Uh, the next function we'll go through is the economic calculator. What this allows you to do is do a quick, some quick calculation <clears throat> for budgeting purposes. So I'll just throw in some quick numbers here. Uh, we'll have a yield of 40, uh, price of $12. So throw in some quick costs here. Okay, so what this shows you is um, value of product, which is simply the, um, the yield by the price at $480 an acre. Uh, I've entered all my costs, my variable costs. So it's calculated to be $274.71. So it just shows you what your contribution 
margin is simply your value production minus your costs <clears throat> and the price required per bushel to cover your variable costs. So just a quick tool of, um, to help you with budgeting. Okay, so here we'll go back to the, the home page again. Uh, the next uh, thing we'll click on is trial protocols. So what this link does, it's the protocols for both the small and large plot sites. It'll go through um, all the information we, we use for, for actually growing the sites, anything from uh, seeding, herbicide application, swathing, harvest, to how all the, the relevant data is uh, generated. So if you want to know how the uh, trials were conducted, this is your best link to, to go, go to to find out any information. Back to the home page again here. Uh, one last thing, um, much like what I've just taken you through is a video tour. I'll just play the first uh, 20 seconds here. So up pops the video, click on play. Hello and welcome to the Canola Performance Trials web application brought to you by the Canola Council of Canada. This application represents the next generation in variety evaluation for Western Canadian canola growers. Trials provide relevant and unbiased performance data that reflect actual production practices and compare to data on winning varieties as well as newly introduced ones. So what that will do is just give you another walk through the site if, um, if maybe it's a few months since you've seen this webinar and you want uh, another quick refresher course of the site or um, I've just missed something, just uh, it's a 12 minute video, it'll take you through the entire site. So uh, I hope I've touched on most of the, um, the information for the website here and uh, thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, uh, just as we transition to uh, Dan to, to take over and talk a little bit about fertility, there was one uh, question that came in uh, just asking, it's a question from Aaron, and it said, when you do a variety comparison, is the data only from small plot data? Uh, you can choose in that, that filter that pops up whether you want to use the small plot or, or large plot data. All right. Great. Um, well, with that, uh, I think we'll switch over and... Uh, let Dan take over the screen now, and, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, a few key fertility issues uh, as we head into seeding this year's crop. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Derwin. Uh, thanks, Sean. That was really good. Uh, as mentioned, my name's Dan Orchard. I uh, work out of central Alberta. And nothing really too earth-shattering here today, just kind of some friendly reminders, I guess, and tips to maybe help improve your chances of success this year. So uh, before I guess I get into the fertility too far, I think it's kind of important to make sure you set realistic uh, yield goals. And uh, we were a little short on moisture in a lot of areas kind of heading into the year, but this past week or two kind of has changed that around a little bit. Right when guys were ready to go seeding, we got a bunch of moisture in a lot of the prairies. So I think that's a pretty good thing. And um, in general, canola can produce about four bushels per inch of uh, plant available moisture. So this would include the moisture that's already in the soil plus the moisture you, you receive uh, in season. So having said that, um, other than moisture, you know, the most limiting factor a lot of times with production tends to be nitrogen. And canola requires around three or three and a half pounds of nitrogen to produce a bushel. And this can obviously be a little more or less depending on the environment. Um, and this nitrogen has to come from uh, what remains in the soil after last year's crop. And obviously that would be quite low if you had a higher yielding crop than you anticipated last year. And then also you'll receive uh, nitrogen from mineralized organic matter and plus whatever you add as fertilizer. And there may be some losses to consider in there, but hopefully if you know management practices are, are good, the losses should be minimal. After speaking uh, with a few people and kind of dis discussing prices of nitrogen and the price of canola, I decided I was going to confide in one of these or a few of these nitrogen calculators that are available on the internet. And uh, 
it's, it's kind of a really useful interactive way that allows you to change and update prices of fertilizer, in particular this one here. Um, and it kind of spits out the, the best return rate of nitrogen. Um, and, and so I, I punched in a bunch of numbers into these calculators, a few different calculators, and pretty much all of them suggest um, not really cutting back on, on the nitrogen. So this particular example here, I use $700 a ton urea and canola at 12 bucks a bushel. And you can see that the um, calculator kind of spits back 130 or 140 pounds of nitrogen. So I think it's important to make sure your moisture res regime will, will accommodate, you know, using this much nitrogen. Um, I, th I think the purpose of this screen is just to show that although fertilizer prices are a little high, so, so is the canola price. So it doesn't look like cutting back um, on nitrogen is, is, is going to be a you know, really good idea this year. And there is rumors of really high price nitrogens. So I did this, I ran this scenario again with $900 a ton urea, and it didn't really change the numbers a whole lot. So still um, 120, 130 pounds of nitrogen seem to be kind of the best rate to be putting on as far as, as return goes. <clears throat> so that was a little bit uh, surprising, but with, with $12 canola and, and even higher, I think we can see that, you know, you want to keep the nitrogen topped up. And because we're kind of focusing more today on establishment and, and seeding success, I want to stress the importance of, of uh, seed place safety and fertilizer. So safe nitrogen levels uh, with canola are actually quite surprisingly low. And this is just one of the charts that illustrate this. I, it's kind of a little blurry on the screen, but um, the problem with seed placed fertilizer and seed burn is, in my opinion, it's very hard to diagnose. And the plants just don't seem to emerge, and sometimes this leaves you to blame, you know, other factors like maybe cutworms or seeding too deep or cold soil. So I think kind of the moral of the story here is just to keep the nitrogen away from the seed, um, if possible. Uh, seed's very expensive, so we don't really want to be, you know, keeping it from coming out of the ground. Um, Top dressing nitrogen, in my opinion, kind of really only has two applications. Either the weather conditions have improved such that your yield potential has increased since seeding time, or maybe you just couldn't access product or just uh, couldn't put enough on at seeding for, for one reason or another. Um, one important reminder here with top dressing is to target the roots and not the leaves. So the amount of nitrogen that can be taken up through the foliage really isn't enough to impact your yield. Some micronutrients, you know, you may get a response when you apply them to the leaves, but certainly I wouldn't expect this with nitrogen. So, you know, the plant just requires too high of amounts and, and can only take this up through the roots. <clears throat> Regus has shown that uh, canola can take up to seven pounds of N per acre per day. Um, so obviously it needs to be applied safely using, you know, proper application methods and timing. So adding nitrogen, um, you know, two gallons of, of 2800 or something like that to, to your spray uh, of weeds or when you're applying fungicide really only gives you, you know, five or six pounds of N, which that crop can use in a day um, in peak demand. So it, it's not going to really do a whole bunch. And, and uh, higher rates than two or three gallons with, with flat fan nozzles has a really high degree of risk and, and likely would burn the crop. So better methods of in-crop nitrogen application include stream bars or dribble bars um, using liquid products like 2800. And you can also use you know, granular products like urea or ammonium sulfate. Um, they work well also. <clears throat> but regardless of, of the product you use, you want to make sure this is done prior to the six leaf stage. Although there's kind of been some research showing that, you know, um, up to early flowering can still give good responses, but I wouldn't really suggest kind of waiting that long. And so for those in Alberta and, and most of Saskatchewan, I think around the 15th or 20th of June is kind of the time when you're going to be making this decision uh, to top dress and go out and evaluate and, and get it done. Um, and whether it's liquid or dry products, you need a half inch to, uh, or yeah, roughly half an inch of rain to dissolve this into soil, the soil solution and get this nitrogen down to the roots. So it's important to remember 
you will need rain after as well. Um, over to phosphate, canola does require a modest amount of phosphate and, and again, because we're more concerned about seeding success here today, I'm not really going to talk so much about the total amount of, of nutrients as much as I will about placement and seed safety. So when you're deciding if or when to place phosphate with your seed, I think a really good guideline is 20 or 25 pounds per acre, acre in your soil sample, which is around 10 uh, parts per million. So uh, once your soil test levels kind of get to this point in Alberta and Saskatchewan anyway, um, the chance of, of seed placed response with phosphate is, is quite significant and I think it's you know, even higher in Manitoba. So um, this is just kind of a guideline to, to keep in mind that you, you probably will get a response to placing it with the seed once your levels um, get down to, to these low levels in the soil. The reason for placing phosphate close to the seed is is strictly because of its lack of mobility. So you can see here each square represents one square inch of movement and this is roughly two weeks after the fertilizer has been placed in the ground. So the little blue dot is the pearl of phosphate and the dark green is a zone of, of kind of high concentration phosphate around it. And it's really only moving about a square inch compared to some of the other macronutrients which have much better movement. So you can see the, the limited mobility requiring you to place it close to the seed. And here's a representation of um, phosphate placement at various rates. So you can see the red circles are the pearls of, of fertilizer phosphate and the little dots down the center of this tape are, are, are the canola, represent the canola seed. And you can see the distance between the fertilizer and seed um, would be too far to get kind of even distribution of phosphate and, and this at these rates would likely lead to you know, non-uniform emergence. Here at 15 and 20 pounds, the distribution and placement uh, of the fertilizer is probably giving you much more access to these nutrients and, and I think here what you'd increase your chances of a more uniform emergence. And once we kind of get up to 30 pounds of FOSS, which is 60 pounds of product going down with the seed, um, you can run into toxicity issues and, and burning of the seed. So like I said before, this isn't um, really easy to diagnose and finding little blue seed is hard enough right behind the cedar, let alone you know a couple weeks later when you're when you're digging around. <clears throat> Here's a an excellent tool I found for establishing safe rates of seed placed fertility. Um, I put the link at the bottom. It's not a very easy website or page to find at all. It's um, kind of hidden away, but anyway, there are many. Uh, Chart, other charts like this out there, but this one kind of allows you to change some variables um, and, and change the products that you intend to use. Um, and one of the variables that it allows you to change is, is your tolerated stand loss. So how, how much seed are you willing to kind of accept as a, 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 an amount getting burned in the soil? So um, <clears throat> here you can see um, an example of a one inch opener, seven inch spacing. And um, under moist conditions, I punched in here, um, the safe rates of um, monoammonium phosphate, which, you, which I punched in here, um, is around 44 pounds of product, which seemed a little bit surprising to me, but um, this gives you 24 pounds of actual P. So I played around a little more and went to nine inch spacing, same product, but under borderline conditions where it's not really moist and it's not really dry. And, and the rate was significantly cut um, quite a bit lower than, than I expected. So 12 pounds of actual P is the only safe rate um, according to this guideline. And they, they did a lot of research and had a lot of data points for this. And um, this is significantly lower than the provincial guidelines kind of in Western Canada for, for uh, safe rates of seed place phosphate. So, after I discussed this with John Hurd a little bit, it was noted that a lot of the provincial work um, done in the prairies was done at higher seeding rates. And now we're kind of leaning towards uh, lower seeding rates and, and wider spacing. Um, so I think maybe we need to be really cautious with our provincial guidelines and, and certainly not pushing the limits because I'm finding um, other places around uh, the world tend to lower their seed, seed safety rates uh, even lower than ours are. 
real quickly, potassium um, benefits can be seen from placing potassium chloride uh, with your cereals, but, but this kind of benefit of placing it with the canola seed hasn't really been observed. Um, so, you know, if soil, if low soil levels or, or not non-balanced potassium in your soil, soil canola might respond, uh, but cereals are, are kind of more likely. So I, I don't think it's real important to, to make sure that there's a bunch of um, potash in, in, in with your seed blend if you're putting fertilizer with the seed. And on to sulfur, um, again, no need to place sulfur with the seed. It's just something else that's going to possibly add to the to the burn of the seed, which we don't want. So um, I recommend putting it away from the seed or broadcasting it or, or whatever other technique you can possibly use uh, aside from putting it with the seed. It would have to be put at toxic levels in order to meet the crop demands if you put it all with the seeds. So <clears throat> not probably um, a really wise decision. And, and you can top up sulfur in crop as well, similar to nitrogen. Um, you know, there's some data showing maybe you can even do it a little later than you could with nitrogen, but I don't think you want to wait until you see problems. Um, kind of the earlier the better is always a, a good rule of thumb for top dressing any product. So sulfur would be the, the same situation. So kind of to wrap things up here, um, the prices suggest keeping your fer fertility topped up this year. Um, even though the price of fertilizer seems a little high, it, it is offset by the high price of canola, so kind of keep those levels up. And less is better when we talk seed-placed fertilizer. So unless you have really, really low phosphate levels in your soil and the soils are cool and wet, <clears throat> try to keep that uh, fertilizer away from the seed as, as much as possible. Um, it sometimes isn't that convenient and, and the timing of your fills gets thrown off, but I think it's 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 worth the extra time and effort to, to make sure you're safely putting the seed down to kind of better your chances of all that seed coming up. And um, evaluating top dressing prior to, to the six leaf stage of canola is, is definitely advised. So I really want to give special thanks to Regis and John for short notice phone call yesterday to kind of discuss all of this. It was thrown together, um, you know, in a bit of a hurry. So, um, and also the Canola Council crop production team, um, Doug and Troy and everyone who kind of gave me their opinions and helped guide me through this a little bit. So I appreciate your attention and I think we'll turn it back to Derwin here. Great, thanks very much for that, Dan. Um, uh, just before we switch over to Doug and, and talk a little bit more about stand establishment, there were a couple of questions. One was for me, in my introduction, I think I may have neglected to mention about, we do have one uh, crop management uh, CEU credit available to both the certified crop advisors and anyone that's a member of uh, the certified uh, crop science consultant. Uh, uh, program as well. Uh, we'll be showing a code at the end of the webinar after uh, Doug wraps up his part of the webinar and uh, sharing with you how to how how to access the link to submit that uh, that information. So we'll get to that uh, when Doug finishes up. Uh, there uh, were a couple of questions on the fertility end of things. So since there's just a couple, I think maybe we'll deal with those right now, Dan. Um, the first question was uh, just with regard on the phosphate end of things, a question that often comes up with regard to the uh, phosphate inoculants. Uh, they were just wondering uh, what response you have seen or have you seen any any uh, uh, work with regard to, to the phosphate inoculants applied to the seed? Um, I I think that the situations where the phosphate inoculant is beneficial, it's, it's certainly not a widespread area, and it's you know not a you can't blanket the whole prairies to say that you know um, this phosphate inoculant is going to give a response. But but it is, if you understand kind of when and where the the likelihood of a response is from these inoculants, you know something where the phosphate is is there but tied up from from calcium or other um, nutrient interactions, then I think you better your chances of, of spending your money in the right spot. I wouldn't 
go out and um, simply treat everything with, with these inoculants just on the chance that you're going to get a response. I think if you kind of, like I said, understand when and where they're most likely, um, then, then perhaps you'll, you'll find that you're going to better your chances of you know, getting a return on your investment. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dan. That's that's uh, some good advice. Uh, on the next question, uh, the, it was: Are there any advantages to using liquid fertilizer versus granular? Um, not not that really jump out at me, but I, I guess one advantage is um, it can be metered or or monitored. The rates are are you know much more accurate, which isn't a huge advantage but it is an advantage you, you know I hear people say that they're trying to put on 33.8 gallons per acre and that's what that's what they put on you know where when you're applying dries you're you're applying somewhere between you know 230 and 260 pounds per acre so there's a lot more <clears throat> you know give and room for error there whereas the liquid is going through a, a squeeze pump meter usually and and is very very accurate but as far as crop response goes or availability or anything like that as long as there's adequate soil moisture really there isn't huge advantages um, having one over the other nitrogen is nitrogen and phosphate is phosphate so um, they they all work out um, relatively equal I think as far as crop response uh, very good uh, the, the next question was, are you guys still advocating a nitrogen to sulfur ratio, and if so, what is it? Well, I'm not so sure we're so much advocating a nitrogen to sulfur ratio as just to, to be sure you have adequate sulfur to, to kind of use the nitrogen that you're applying. So um, the 7 to 1 ratio has been thrown around for years, and then with with hybrids and increased production, you do hear five to one. So I think if if you're just blindly um, applying a blend and you you haven't taken soil samples and and stuff like that, and um, you know using a five to one ratio isn't a bad idea in your blend. Like I say, if you if you have no um, prior history of your, of the field and don't really know the nutrient levels, if I was just to um, walk into the fertilizer retailer and pick a blend, I would probably try to make sure the sulfurs um, or the nitrogen to sulfur ratio is around that five to one. Okay, great Dan. I think in the interest of time we'll we'll move over to Doug now and let him cover uh, the uh, the stand establishment portion of, of the webinar today. Uh, there's a number of other questions, a lot of them look to be somewhat product specific, so uh, we may revisit them depending on time at the end of the webinar, or we've captured these in the go-to system, and and I can maybe pass them on to Dan, and he can uh, can uh, deal with them individually. So with that, we'll maybe switch things over to Doug. There we go. Well, thanks, Derwin. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Sean. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm sort of going to wrap up the today here with the idea of stand establishment. Can you hear me okay, Derwin? Yep, coming through loud and clear. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so what I wanted to start off with is just points to ponder or the philosophy of determining targeted plant populations. What I'm not going to come up with here just to get so that I don't set up any expectations, I'm not going to say that the ideal plant stand is going to be this or this is the exact seeding rate, but I think the idea is to look at the philosophy of what what we have to be thinking about going into this upcoming season, especially with the large seed size that's going on. Because one of the things we're starting to see is a little bit like this. This is actually showing up in some fields. Um, it's interesting under the science cluster research, uh, Julie Leeson from uh, Egg Canada did a survey across Western Canada over the last couple of years. And she had looked at a uh, number of fields in each of the provinces and for example, we'll use the Alberta example is that last year he, she surveyed over 218 fields in Alberta, although not a big sample but still it showed that basically that 34% of those 218 fields had less than four plants per square foot. The interesting thing about this is that 41% of that 34% of the fields were seeded at five pounds per acre. Additionally, there was probably another 20% that she showed that there were patches in fields that were less than optimal. So. 
in relationship, there was probably about 50% of the fields that she surveyed that did not reach optimal yields just because of plant stands. So it's kind of interesting that way. As well as is that she found out is that 21% of the producers that she talked to did not ha uh, do plant counts, and which follows along a research project that the Canola Council just undertook here where they did a survey where less than less than 75% or I should say approximately 75% of the producers do not do plant counts. And so going into this season with $10 a pound seed, uh, potential for $14 a uh, bushel canola, the idea is that we have to know what we're putting in the ground. The thing is too is, is that there's also this trend to push uh, seeding. And the fact is that we start to look at the case May 2nd, guys are going to go hard. But the problem that comes with this is mudding it in. And this is what shows on this picture here is that you've got a person here that's mudded it in and really not helping their emergence cause. If you look at the very top of the screen, there are some plants coming up, but really where they see that tire track, there should be a canola plants coming up and there's nothing there. So the idea here is, is let's take a look at this. So to start off, this is just some stuff from Bernie Hill from AAFC, and I always confuse him with Benny Hill, the former comedian, but the one thing to look at here, people, is, is that um, we are not God, so we can't predict precipitation. Precipitation is probably our biggest predictor to emergence, and so we have to think of what can we do to enhance our emergence with based on soil matter, organic matter, temperature, soil pH, soil texture, and soil type. And so it's really important that we manage the, uh, manage the agronomics that we can manage and let the precipitation handle itself. Uh, this is actually from Murray Hartman, and a lot of you have seen this, but I just wanted to re-emphasize this critical plant population levels appears to be that four and five plants per square foot up to 10. And the one thing to think about here is that Yanti, uh, uh, SVN Gaddy, over three years showed that canola was related, plasticity of canola was related to plant population and was uh, the environment that it was surrounded by. And typically yield recovery was based upon plant population and the plasticity. The anti GAN from Ag Canada has come out and furthered up this research. And what he is finding typically is that this four plants per square foot is again this critical level. And that typically is that when you have four plants per square foot or higher, your yield goes up linearly until about 10 plants per square foot and it gives you your best chance. When you're at four plants, uh, uneven stands, or a little bit lower, you typically are seeing lower yields. And he's seeing anywhere from 13 to 20 percent yield losses by not having in that four plants and above. So I think it's really critical that we try to get out there and get producers and, and producers listening is to try to get to that five plants or better here during the growing season. Just to add to this as well, as Yanti Gann has found, is that typically on the high yielding sites when he's looked at all these different plant populations and uniformity, is that typically where you have five and six plants per square foot and greater and you have minimal loss through the growing seasons as highest yield. And that typically when he did see yield losses on these plant stands is that when he typically lost plants through the growing year. And it would typically slip below that that le those critical levels. So again, it's really important that we establish a good plant stand at the beginning of the season. So, so getting on with this seed size. We've seen this over the last couple of years. It's been increasing. The unfortunate part is that we haven't been adjusting our seeding rates and sometimes maybe our net management hasn't been adjusted accordingly. We are seeing reduced stands. But the one question always is that larger seed will have a higher survivability than smaller seed. And we've seen this with Bob Elliott's research from a number of years ago. Unfortunately, is, is that we don't have any research with five gram and six gram per thousand or higher, because a lot of the research that was done then was comparing 2.5 to three versus four to four and a half. And so we don't know if we are getting that much more survivability with anything to do that five or six gram per thousand seed weight. So where is the target plant stand? Is it eight plants per square foot, especially with this large seed? Or as we've been saying, is target that 10 to get, try to achieve 10 and make sure you're above that four or five? And you know, typically we always ask ourselves, are seven to eight robust plants, you know, are they a good crop? Yes, that's my opinion, uh, very robust plants. They're a very viable crop as long as we maintain that critical plant population, about four or five. So the things that we have to be thinking about here is, is that when we go to determine what our seeding rate is going to be for this year and we have to look at it, basically we have to know what was your average plant stand last year. And the unfortunate part again is, is that when you look at most of Western Canada, only about 25% or actually know what their plant stand was. It makes it really question is that how critical do we have to be when it comes to is that when we determine our seeding rates. 
then we have to ask ourselves, what was our average seeding rate and what was your average seed size? And those are some important questions that you have to be asking yourself when we're doing that. Some other things you have to think about is when do you plan to start seeding? Um, do you have two different seed size lots, uh, varieties, and should you mix? So if you're planning on starting seeding over the next while, you have to look at a few things and we'll discuss that in a few seconds. But do you have two different size seed lots? And so what should be the game plan? If you're planning on seeding into cooler soils, keeping your seeding rates into that five pounds per acre and you've got a six or a four gram, you have to decide, do I go at six gram per thousand seed weight into these cold soils where temperature will have an effect on my emergence and I'm going to have less seeds per unit area? Or do maybe I go to my lower seed size knowing full well that it may, may not have as high a survivability as I'd like to be as I would with maybe a six but I have more seeds per unit area. And so potentially the philosophy you should be thinking about here at the end of the day is that maybe my four gram per thousand should be going into those cooler soils and my six gram per thousand should be going into a little bit warmer soil conditions just for the simple fact that if I'm going to maintain a seeding rate of five pounds per acre, I need to be thinking about seeds per unit area and potential for uh, crop to come on the ground. The question is being asked right now is should you mix? Uh, the, the, the down and dirty is no. The idea is, is that if you have the same variety with two, diff or two different seed sizes, you should be seeding them separately for the simple reason is that if you have some issues in the field where maybe you start seeing every second or third plant starting to die, your question is, well, what seed lot was it? Unless you've kept a sample, you cannot really determine that. As well as is that if you're going to be mixing, you have to take the time to take all your seed and start mixing it into, let's say, a cement mixer or some way of form so you get equal distribution of that variety in seed lot. If you start throwing one bag in on top of the other bag, you could potentially have areas within your field where you could have patches. And so determining which seed lot maybe have been the issue, we don't really know. Come on, what's going on here? Okay. So when we look at seed survivability, you know, this is a chart that's available on our website. Um, it's downloadable. You can laminate it. But just to show you the two different things, if we look at a 5.5 gram per thousand seed weight, and we look at a 40% survivability here up top and on the right hand side 70%. You can see here is that at the 40% survivability, we have to be into that minimum seven to eight pounds an acre just to get our five and six plants per square foot. The unfortunate part will be is that not many producers and not many people want to seed at that higher rate, especially a $10 pound seed. But if we can bump this up to 70, we could be into that four and five pounds based on the five and a half and that puts it on the cusp. Now, the unfortunate part is that five and six plants per square foot, we are basically on the borderline. And so we have to really understand is here is, is that you may be at the border, you may get a little bit higher percentage, but put you up closer to that eight. But again, you have to make sure that your agronomics are getting you the most maximum return for that seed. And so still you'd want to be targeting that five and six pounds. Uh, we'll, so if we want to take a look at the seeding rate calculation, typically the calculation is 9.6 which is times the desired plant density divided by the estimated seed survival. So if I'm targeting eight plants and I look at 9.6 times eight times six gram per thousand using a 70% survivability rate, I have to be, have to be at six and a half pounds per acre to get that eight plants. Now, if I can just in bump up my rates by 10%, an emergence rate by 10% because I've decided to take the fertility away from the seed or I'm gonna wait for a couple degree more temperature just to get a few more plants out, I can now lower that down to five and a half pounds, which is most producers typically will try to target that five. Now when we talk about the survivability, 80% we have to keep in mind is, is that we are looking at, is that if you take a look at a seed lot and the germ is 92, already you have 8% of the seeds that are not going to typically emerge. So when we're talking 80%, that is including your germination. So you haven't much room for error. You've only got about 12% loss based on that 80. Now if we go down to a four gram per thousand down below here, you can see here that if we target 70% emergence, we can be into that four and a half pounds, but if we use a typical rate of 50%, what we see across Western Canada, we still have to be up in that six. So it's really important is that we somehow do the right agronomic traits to get that emergence out of the ground to keep that survivability up. So. When we start asking these questions about where should I be my seeding rate in relation to my seed size, the things or questions that we have to be asking is, is your seeding tool tuned like a race car or the old quad? And this is important because if you haven't got your drill balanced as far as front to back and leveled side to side, maybe your, uh, 
your uh, basically your your feeding system is not running properly, all the things that would make your your air drill run t properly, if that aren't isn't running, that has an effect typically on your canola seed. Uh, if we go back to some of the older stuff that at the Canola Council, the research that we did, a, sort of like an ad hoc research, we just looked at some um, just fan speeds with different types of moisture with seed. We did find that as seed got drier, typically we could do more damage with, with fans. And if we're trying, we haven't set up our drill properly, we have some potential to do some real harm to our seed before it even gets into the ground. The other thing we'll think about is what type of style of opener do I have? Am I a narrow five eighths opener? Am I three quarter one inch or a paired row? Am I have I got different what type of opener I'm dealing with? As well as am I a mid row or double or a single shoot system? These all have an effect is, is that when I'm going to determine my rate, like how much fertility am I putting through and how well is everything running as far as where my openers are at. So when you look at this as an older drill, yes, but the idea is, is to look at your drill and go through it with a fine tooth comb prior to seeding and making sure that things are running correctly. Because one of the things we want, don't want to be seeing here is that we don't want to be seeing that seed in the fertilizer row. And so what happens here is you can see her in the blue seed and right beside there's these fertilizer pearls. They're supposed to be up on the shelf. Now this is a function of speed. This is, was a picture taken by a former agronomist here at the Canola Council. This is a trial he did on farm just looking at seeding speed. And just by going uh, 5.3 miles an hour, he could see most of the seed was starting to drop into his fertilizer trench. So seed will st our f seed w speed will play a role, but the idea is if you also have some worn openers, that will have an effect on well, how well you place your seed. And so some of the things also comes with drills that we do, we have seen this, especially the uh, last couple of years, I've seen this in areas where guys have bought newer iron, have not gone out and really leveled the drills and taken the time to really balance it, and I've seen this in a few fields here in the last couple of years where basically the guy took delivery of his drill, uh, four days later he's out seeding and these are some of the problems that does show up. So it's really important to make sure that that drill is, is fine tuned. So when we look at seeding depth, one of the things to think about is as we're checking um, and deciding how we're going to look at our seeding uh, rates, one of the things we have to figure out is where are we going to be going for our moisture. Ideally we want to go to that three quarter to one inch and the research has shown us that we have to be into that top inch but this is the importance of having that drill level balanced and we're going at the proper seed so we are placing majority of seed because if we start getting into that inch, inch and a half and down below we start to lose close to 50% of our seed that we should normally have above ground is now stuck and not coming out of the ground and so we can limit our plant population just by not continually checking our depth. And so this is actually a picture that Derwin took here from a couple of years ago from a site at Maffrey where they look at different seed depths and one thing to show here is you can see is that how more robust, how much bigger the plants are when you start getting to that half to an inch and a quarter versus a three inch and that will help for the long term survivability because if we go back to the research work by Agati showing is that typically the high ceiling sites is where you have no death loss through the growing season, we want these big robust plants getting us through that, through that year. Some other thoughts you have to think about is that last year if you did a plant count or as an agronomist you're doing plant counts for your, your producers is that if you're at six plants per square foot and you were dealing with small seed you have some concerns especially if you're going to be dealing with some big seed this year. If that was a plant stand with a large seed you probably are okay but we should still look at tweaking that system because we still don't know what's going to happen 10 days to 21 days out. We don't know what kind of frost we're going to have. So if we were at that six plants and we were at small seed what do we have to do to get that up? And if it's large seed, what can we do just to fine tune? When do you plan to start seeding? Uh, typically, we look at is that when is your uh, average soil temperature? And you saw on our canola watch here from the last couple of weeks, we talked about taking soil temperatures and taking a look at what should be your average to start your seeding. But if you are going to be pushing your soil temperatures and you are starting to go into that two and three degree soil because you can't wait, you're going to have to look at is that potentially you are harming your crop and you are going to be looking at potentially minimizing the amount of emergence or you're going to be restricting and resistance from the fact of cold soils. The problem also that goes on with cold soils is that you do basically expose your seed or your young cotyledons to disease, insects, and it, because it is slow growing, uh, typically sometimes your insecticide treatment may not last as long once it gets out above the ground. When you take a look at with most insecticides lasting anywhere from 21 to 28 days, depending upon um, you know levels or put on the seed, 
you take a look at by the time it comes out of the ground, if it's been in the ground for 15 to 16 days, you may only have six to 10 days of uh, coverage, which will then affect is that how much action feeding you may have from flea beetles. So it's really important is that when you are putting in the ground, take a look at your temperature and then adjust accordingly. If you're going to push it, you have to be thinking about maybe I should bump up in my seeding rate. One thing that's sometimes not looked at but should be looked at is what is the upcoming weather forecast. And if your soils are on a little bit on the cooler side and it's four degree soils or, you know, four going on five, but they're talking like 18 to 20 degree days and the nights of four and five, probably you could get going seeding from the simple fact is that you know that the weather is going to be warmer. Now, if they're predicting colder weather over the next little while, then there are some concerns. So this graph is in our... Um, our manual, a lot of you have seen that, but just to show you is that the fact is that if you can get into the ground with good uh, temperatures into that four to six to eight degrees, you can see here in these two lines here, the orange and the blue and potentially green, you've got some nice even emergence that's relatively fast. Typically the germination is within five to six days and you typically get emergence with about four or five days after. It's when we're really pushing those cold soils and the state cold is that emergence gets more delayed and that's going to affect your plant populations. This is actually from Alberta Agriculture's website. This is actually a predictor and looks at a weather module. And what this looks at is that you can look at your average daily temperature, long-term max and mins, and the probability of frost date, and you can start seeing the green line. Whoops. This is the green line, which is your probability of a frost, spring frost. And you start looking at your average temperatures. Now, this is based at the St. Paul site. What you can see here is that the minimum temperatures have been going up and the daytime temperatures have been going up and everything. So you can see our frost risk here is starting to decline as we get farther and farther out into April. So when we're trying to take into account is when we should start seeding, this is probably another indicator tool to help you decide is that when should I actually start looking at seeding. This is on their roping the website. Some other things that Dan talked about it here, his thoughts and questions is basically fertility with the seed. Are you putting some with the seed? Are you not? Are you putting it mid-row? Are you putting it band below? If you are putting fertility with the seed, you have to really watch your levels because if you start getting too high again, that's going to affect your emergence. The other thing is to think about is are you measuring seed depth continually? Interesting thing is, is that 50% of producers in Western Canada are measuring on a continual basis, but the other 40 to 50 sometimes set it in the first couple laps and they sometimes go out and check it once or twice. But the idea here is, is that continually measure it. These are agronomic things that will help you determine what you should be thinking about as far as how much survivability. Is it direct seeded, cultivated, or managed for straw? And one of the reasons a lot of people might not think about this is, is that if you're direct seeding into a heavy trash cover with a narrow opener, you are typically going into very cool soils and so your survivability rate might not be as high as well as is that you may be more prone to frost. And if typically if it is cooler, you may have some flea beetles come in and feed in the straw and on the underside and they could typically do a lot of damage to the plants before they even really get above the straw per se. If you're dealing with cultivated or managed um, soils or managed for straw, one thing you have to think about is, is that typically if you've cultivated your land because you had a heavy straw issue, that top two or three inches that you worked, you're looking at potentially a lot of moisture moving in and out in the system and so you may not have that nice compacted soil that will really give you that good seed to soil moisture contact and keep that moisture there. One of the things to look at here too, this is actually a field here where you can see here, this is fertility with the seed and you can see the bigger plants and you see some later emergence. Now the conditions were got a little bit wetter after this, this is done at Lara, where they look at different amounts of nitrogen with the seed, but you can see here that there's bigger amounts of nitrogen. This is a 30 pounds of urea and you can see here how much this the rear is really thinning it back now. Moisture played some role in helping it come back, but it's important to think about all of this stuff. This is another trial where we just looked at a urease inhibitor. At this time, it was actually, um, this one here was, um, was agritane, and what you can see here on this plot here, the agritane actually, basically the coated urea was the, uh, basically saved the plant stand. We saw the same thing with ESN. And it was a way just to look as if we have to be bumping those nitrogen and we want to put the fertility rates up there. We have to look at some coatings. Uh, when it comes to managing a straw, this is actually from a field last year where the guy had such a heavy straw load that he worked the top four to five inches. Then he went in and packed it and seeded and you can see the stand that he got. This is in the middle of July. And the importance of this one is, is that he dried out that top four to five inches so much is that when he did, was limited on moisture that year, you can see here the results. And this is ultimately affected their yield. 
So we have to be thinking about trash or straw, and so when we go to set our realistic survivability percentage, we have to be really thinking about what are all the little management things that I do right, or am I trying to do right, and what are the management things that I know I need to improve on. And hopefully that will help you decide, and so you don't end up with spots in the field that look like this. So sort of summarize this, I'm not going to come up and say you need to say Western Canada is 50%, that is the average. But when it comes time to sitting down and figuring out the philosophy, you have to be asking all these questions here so that you can actually give yourself a more realistic um, decision-making tool as far as how you should actually go as far as the seating rate. I will just wrap up with saying is, is that really to be truly um, as, as precise as possible, we need to, you need to know what last year's plant populations. And unfortunately, the five pound per acre adage doesn't sit anymore because with bigger seed size, you're not going to be uh, getting the plant populations you hope. And if you look at the trend lines that's coming out of uh, Yanti Gans research, it's really that five plants is the critical level. So with that, I'm done. Questions? <clears throat> Thanks very much, Doug. Um, um, we did have a couple of questions on on your part. Uh, I'll just go back a little bit to the uh, the the research that contributed to the seed calculation equation, and and the question was, was that done on OPs or hybrids? But I read in between the lines. I think maybe there's a bit of confusion about the plant population versus yield chart and the calculator for determining your seeding rate, which is really just mathematics. So maybe if you could. Well, it, it just, it's just straight line math. The idea is to look at, at um, if I've got a five gram per thousand seed rate and I say I've got 50% emergence or 70% emergence, to get that plant stand out uh, of the ground, this is my seeding rate. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is is that OPs versus hybrids. Hybrids typically, from the work that Elliot showed, was anywhere from between 10 and around that 10% higher emergence rates or higher survivability rates just because of the seed size and hybrid vigor. And so making that determination of what is the survivability, um, you know, you typically your hybrid. Now, there's a lot of discussion with some of the agronomists I talk with and even within our group is that the survivability probably is a lot higher with the hybrids versus the OPs, but it still comes down to basic math. If I've got a six gram per thousand and I think I've got 70% emergence or 7% survivability, I have, to calc I have to get to this seeding rate to get these many plants per square foot. Now as far as the graph that Murray put together here, that was a combination of a number of trials across Western Canada, including a lot of hybrids. And that five plants per square foot is a critical level. And Yanti Gans research with Egg Canada is all the top end hybrids. It's still showing the same thing. Four and five plants is critical levels. Well, that's that's a good description, Doug. I think it it it's uh, just a summary that that equation is really just math. But where the the research comes in and the new research on the hybrids is helping us better figure out what's a realistic survival number to use in that equation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next question uh, was just with regard to that survival number again, and, and the question was, have you seen increased seed survival with the use of independent opener drills? And so they used the example, have we gone from 50% survival with an older Concord, for example, to maybe 60, 70 percent with some of the new seed pop, seed master type type drills. Do you, have you seen any any results to suggest that the newer technology is helping with seed survival? Well, there's two ways to look at this one, Derwin. Uh, one being is is that just from looking at different fields. Uh, with producers, I am seeing some better stands with the newer drills and the singularity feeding and the independent openers. Uh, better plant stand, yes. Um, now, I'll throw a preface at it's the guy operating the actual drill that's going to determine the success because I have seen fields where the latest, greatest technology in the hands of the wrong person doesn't give you a, that much better of a stand. Now, there is a 
also some ongoing research that's being conducted with Ag Canada as well as in Saskatchewan too, where they're looking at different drills, uh, looking at different uh, opener types, etc. And some of the research is showing is, is that um, yeah, we are getting better stance. However, it's still depending on moisture. It's still being dependent on seed and depth. And so, even with the newer drills, it's still very critical that we still have to manage the agronomic portions of having, you know, watching our our uh, all the other little things that are all relate to plant emergence. And so, yes, in one quick question, yes, there's probably uh, some better stand establishment happening with. Uh, the the newer drills and everything, but the concern I have is is that guys are thinking about now I'm going to cut back on seeding rate, and I I hearken back to the research uh, that was just done here last year where they looked at is that close to 35 percent of the fields in Alberta had less than adequate plant populations. Great, good good summary, Doug. Uh, the next question is short and, and sweet. At what depth do you take your soil temperatures? So getting back to your discussion of soil temperature. Well, typically what I look at as soil temperature is that is at depth. So if I'm going to be targeting that three quarters of an inch, I typically want to get my uh, temperature. I want to look at for soil temperatures at one inch of depth. There's two ways of doing it. There's actually soil thermometers, and if you take a look on the edge of your soil thermometer, which was so politely pointed out by Sean here the other day, there's actually two little markings, and that is where typically you want to put it to depth. Um, that little markings there is where you want to look at as well as um, I use myself personally, I use what I call an uh, infrared bearing thermometer and I picked that up at Princess Auto and it works really good, it's called a RayTac, not to promote just them, but what it allows you to do is to take some temperatures quickly and accurately and what I've done here just experimenting the last couple of days is actually dig down underneath the straw and go down an inch and put it and I get an instantaneous reading and it's actually quite accurate because comparing the soil thermometer to this one here yesterday I found basically no difference and it was quite nice to see. However, what I found is with the um, the infrared was is that it was very quick and so I could go down an inch, take a reading, move on and it was it was actually quite good. But inch is where you want to target it. That's your depth. If you're going to go into an inch and a quarter, then target an inch and a quarter. And start at 8 o'clock in the morning and then go out in the afternoon at 4 o'clock and average that over about a three-day period. Very good, Doug. Uh, the next question was if a grower is looking to hit maximum yield, so 60 plus bushels, what should his final stand population be? So what are you targeting for a final plant population? Um, anything above five. Anything above five plants per square foot, the best I can get. It's interesting is um, the initial work by Angadi, but also the work that's being continued on, just to refer back to that, is showing there is a linear yield response up to 10 plants per square foot. However, the critical thing that keeps it showing is that the highest yielding and to maximize um, maximize your your yield, it's keeping the number of death losses down to a minimum. And, and so to me, if you're at six plants per square foot or higher or five, five and a half to six per square foot average or higher over the growing season, you stay that at fall time, you're probably, max, you can maximize your yield that way. Good. Um, I think that covers most of the stand establishment related questions. There was one final one, and it was just a question about s seed applied FOSS and will it increase the survival rate and speed up germination? Uh, well, the research, and this goes way back to the days of Doug Penny and that, but it even applied to back here 10 years ago, is that typically if you apply phosphate with the seed, especially under lower moisture, and now Dan can maybe step into this one as well, uh, you typically, if you have minimal or substandard moisture, you can affect emergence. However, the research is saying is that there is typically anywhere from a two to four bushel an acre advantage to having seed applied phosphate versus no phosphate. And that's from that pop-up effect. However, if you have plants per, if you're looking at plants per square foot, no phosphate, and then some with phosphate into that 15 to 20 pounds, you typically will see lower plant populations. And so some people have told me, uh, and this is all through coffee shop discussion with some producers, they've said they've gone away from seed place phosphate, but they placed it very close to the seed. But it's a matter of what you how and what you want to do with it based upon your soil moisture. But the short and uh, long term is is that 
it's for that pop-up effect. And the short answer is, is that it will not enhance your survival. It could maybe have an effect, detrimental effect on some of your seeds if you're trying to get out of the ground. Could have. And Dan, you can wait in anytime. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it doesn't necessarily speed up germination or increase the survival rate. Just makes those plants that do come up and germinate uh, a little healthier and robust early on in the season. So certainly, it, if anything, it would decrease the survival rate because uh, you know I tend to think any amount of fertilizer is going to decrease this uh, you know the survival rate of an emergence rate. So. Um, it's not going to help with that, but it's going to help the plants that do get up properly, um, you know, to be more robust, like I said, and have early season bigger. Sounds good. Um, maybe uh, just while I'm getting John to switch the screen back over to me, there was one last, uh, there were a number of questions that were kind of product specific, but there was one specific one, Dan, just with regard to uh, the availability of S15 versus ammonium sulfate um, in the growing season. And, and the question was, is S15 less available? And so I know we had this discussion in the recent Canola Watch, so maybe uh, you can just touch on the highlights of that. Yeah, you got to remember that there's elemental sulfur in the S15, so you want to kind of use a rate that's, um, that allows for the sulfate portion to you know to be available to the plant. So if if you need uh, 20 pounds of sulfur is what you're targeting, you need to make sure that 20 pounds is in the sulfate form with the S15. You know if you've been using elemental products for a number of years and managing them properly, then you can get away with continuing that, and maybe you can count on um, some elemental from previous years being available as sulfate to the crop, but for the upcoming season, if you're low on sulfur in the soil and your intentions are to use S15, make sure that uh, you use enough of it that the sulfate portion is going to cover the crop needs, and I think it's like 7.5% sulfate. So just do the math and make sure the sulfate portion is, is what you're using, not, not so much the elemental. Just for clarification, Dan, 7.5% of the 15% or 7.5% of the total product? Total product. Great. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, maybe just we're, we're well beyond the hour, but uh, I see most of our attendees have stuck with us, so it, it's obviously been of great interest. Um, I'm just going to quickly touch on, on one other issue myself and uh, and then... Uh, share the code uh, for anyone needing those those credits, and then we'll get things wrapped up. But just one other one other issue that's come up recently with the announcement that they found some club root DNA in in a couple of fields through the random uh, soil sampling as part of the disease survey here in Manitoba this past year. No positive identification on plants in crop here in Manitoba yet, but uh, certainly the news has picked up on this and it's created some interest. Uh, just wanted to, um, with regard to that, uh, in terms of club root prevention and management, uh, we have done a number of updates on the clubroot.ca website just recently. Uh, lots of the new research is now posted there under the research section here, and there's lots of good information and videos on how to scout for scout for the disease and how to prevent the disease. We've also just recently done. Uh, this sanitation guide, and it and it's not just about the how-to of sanitation, but also how to assess realistically what's your risk for club root, and and uh, establish a, a sanitation program that's appropriate for that level of risk. Um, but it's got lots of good information in there, uh, and so I think the key message is um, in areas where club root is still not not prevalent. Um, I think the key the key points are uh, in, intensive scouting, uh, early early detection is very important uh, to try and keep it localized, and uh, we've seen in Alberta from the Alberta experience 
anything you can do to minimize the buildup of those resting spores in soils and the, and the concentration of those in the soil is going to make the disease much more easy to manage when it does get into your fields. So uh, early detection is really important and the sanitation component where appropriate to, to uh, minimize any risk of, of introducing it to areas where, it's, where it currently isn't found. Uh, are really important. So I think that's all I'm going to say. If you've got questions, you can go to, go to clubroot.ca or contact any of our agronomy specialists if you've got specific questions or concerns on that. And finally, uh, lots of probably been waiting for the code. Uh, uh, so uh, this is the code in red. Uh, you can submit that. Uh, when the webinar ends, uh, you can go to uh, the, uh, this uh, website link and actually, I'm just going to uh, um, I, I'll uh, this uh, website link you can go to, and uh, posted at the top is a link to a, a short feedback survey. And as part of that, you can submit the code and uh, the information, your your membership numbers that we need to submit uh, for those credits on your behalf. So uh, we'll also send out a follow-up email reminder about that uh, with the link included as well. So with that, uh, I want to thank our presenters today. If any of your questions didn't get covered, uh, as I mentioned, they're all captured in the GoToWebinar. Uh, system and we'll uh, forward those to the appropriate presenter and, and uh, hopefully they can get a chance to get back to you on some of those other specific questions. So with that, uh, thanks everyone and uh, have a great rest of your day.